the door. Hello everyone, welcome to another session of our Learning Glass Studio. Today we're going to talk about communicating and quantifying experimental uncertainty, also known as uh, measurement error, experimental error, error analysis. This is an important part of any time you take a measurement is to realize that uh, measurements are not perfect. So. Uh, Anytime you take a measurement, this is important. And of course, when you're doing an experiment, you uh, experiment pretty much means taking measurements to answer a question. So experiments involve uh, observables. If you want to uh, answer a question using an experimental test, you have to observe something that you can use to uh, make a conclusion. So experiments obso in, uh, uh, involve observables to help you get an answer to learn something. And um, uh, in science and engineering, I'll leave some room for this target here. So in science and engineering, Observables are measured. So you uh, want to get an answer, and in science and engineering, which is nice, is you want to get actual quantified value. You want to use math to prove or disprove your point. You can't prove it ever, but you can disprove it, or you can g give evidence for. And math and science uses numbers to uh, make some very constrained, clear conclusions. And for experiments, you use a measurement to uh, give a quantify a measured value. So the observable, observables are quantified by a measured value. So you use some tool to get a number. That's the measurement. And um, what we have to learn and be, keep in mind is that by definition, when you're taking a measurement, you don't know for certain whether how that number, if that number is accurate or not. All you can do is give some assessment on what your best guess is, assuming some range of possibilities depending on your tool and stuff. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So no measurement is perfect. Whenever you take these measurements and report your results and discuss your conclusions, you should always discuss Measurement uncertainty. So this is also called measurement uncertainty. It's also called experimental error. It's also called error analysis. Measurement certainty, experimental uncertainty, um, all of these things that mean basically mean the same thing, that no measurement is perfect. We know that. It's impossible to, to be completely sure if you measure something, uh, what the truth is. But if you're honest and uh, specific about what your range is, that's good enough. That's uh, very powerful to... Uh, find the truth, okay? 
So that's why I drew this target here. This target is, uh, you know, something you throw a dart at or shoot a bow and arrow towards to try to hit this target center value. And this is assuming, of course, you know the truth. So we're assuming that this truth in terms of a numerical value lies right here at the center of this target. And when you take measurements, there's different situations that can happen. So if one situation is that you are taking measurements and assuming you know this value of what you expect, which is not always the case, but in some cases you either have a theory or in a teaching lab, the professor tells you this is the number you should get as a way to learn how to do this, which is um, uh, done in teaching, but less so. And of course, if, when you do research or when you're doing an experiment, you don't know the answer, but you should have a theory or an hypothesis of what you should expect. So assuming this is what we're, our target or our, our, our real or accepted or our truth, what can happen is if you take a measurement, you might get a number somewhere here. And if you take another measurement, you might get something like this, something like this, something like this. So that's one situation that can happen. You keep on getting values around here. Another situation that can happen, I'll change colors here, is you might get a value something like this, then you get a something like this, something like this, something like this, and maybe even something like that. So those are two different situations. What we see is that one is more clustered together and the difference between measurements is not that big, but it's far from the target than this set. This set, it surrounds the target, it's closer to the target in terms of distance, difference between the values, but among each different measurements, they're less clustered. So um, those are two extreme examples where, where this set of, of results, these, four, these five measurements here, these are precise measurements. But they're not accurate. They're precise because it's very repeatable and the tool you're using gives you a very narrow range of answers. Assuming you do the same experiment exactly, the, the repeat the same procedure, the conditions are the same, and you use the same tool, it gives you a precise values, meaning that what that means is that you can get the same answer in a very narrow range. That's different than being accurate. So precision is um, the repeatability or the range that you would expect. And it's not, it's not the same thing as being accurate. This set of experiments here is accurate, meaning that if assuming that this bullseye is a truth, that even though we are scattered, we are accurate in this set of measurements. So this is an accurate set of measurements, but it's not precise because we're kind of getting a scatter that's pretty wide relative to this. We get a, a wide range of values, but they don't deviate away from the, the, the expected value. So those are two um, per, uh, extreme cases. And of course, of what you can uh, 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 conclude from this two extreme cases, what do we want? We want a value that's accurate and precise. So what would be the ideal case is, is if we keep on shooting arrows and keep on doing an experiment, we hit the bullseye in the center every time. That's the, the ideal case, but that's hard to do. It's, it's possible, not perfect of course, but it's possible to do that if you um, are very careful and you have very good tools and it's a simple experiment. But no measurement is perfect. Okay, so what are some situations that can happen? You might have systematic error which is kind of this situation here um, where systematic error means that you get consistent results consistent results that are off 
from the expected value um, that are off in a, in a similar shift. In a similar amount. This is one example of systematic error, where uh, you, you get similar results, and the, the, what this assumes is that you know what's expected. And if you know what's expected and you see that there's a, a shift, then that you can identify systematic error. So to identify systematic error, you need to know the expected result, which is not always the case. And one way that that can happen is that if you were taking a series of measurements, and again, if assuming you knew the real, the real um, value, assuming you had the truth, and you were me taking measurements, measured values, so the truth lies something like this, but one way is if you had an offset systematic error, you're getting something like this. So if the real value is supposed to be something like this, you actually are over, over measure, or your, your measurement over uh, estimates. Uh, similarly, if you keep on going around these, this range of real values, assuming you knew it and it's the truth, and you measure this, that shifted, that's one example of offset. What is it called? Yeah, offset. This is the offset situation. Offset systematic error. Another example of systematic error is if you knew the true, true values again and you're taking measurements, would be uh, assuming you knew the real values that you, you scaled. Like you start up for low values, you uh, match up good, but as you increase the values, your uh, difference gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So it kind of, the, uh, the systematic error scales with the number of the real value. So this would be scale error, scaling error. So they're consistent deviations from the true value. But the thing with systematic error, it can be hard to identify because you have to have some idea of what you're expecting. If you have no idea what you're expecting, then you're, there's no way to know if they're systematically off or not. And um, this happens if you, like for example, you can imagine that maybe uh, if you're trying to measure some uh, bananas at the grocery store and you don't notice that there's some, something in the way basket, there's always some, either some like uh, uh, something, a banana that you, you don't see in there and it's always giving you more weight because there's something in there you don't see or your scale is calibrated. So that would be, an, if, there's some, if there's something, always some there that throws off the, the zero point, that would be an offset error. Or if the calibration of the uh, scale is bad, it might give you a scaling error where like one pound is, it always gives you 1.1 pounds. And if you go to 10 pounds, it's like, it throws on another, uh, pound on there, it scales by some uh, linear growth. So those, uh, that can happen in real experiments. It has to do with uh, how well your, your tools are working, whether there's some unforeseen circumstance throwing things off. It can throw them off by a scaling behavior or an offset behavior. And what does off mean? You have to know what you're looking for, which is not always the case. Okay, so um, random error is another situation which is the, uh, pretty much impossible to eliminate completely, but you can reduce it by different uh, methods and strategies. Systematic error, in principle, if you knew how to, if you had a good calibration of your tools, and if you knew what you were expecting, you could potentially uh, remove systematic error. But random error has to do with uh, the universe, that it's impossible to, as an experimenter, to do the same 
uh, technique every time, to do the same condition every time, to have the same behavior every time, to have the same result every time. So this is um, unpredictable and the magnitude of the deviation depends on many factors, depends on everything. It depends on the tools, uh, skill of the, uh, the, the pe person taking the measurement, um, conditions that might change or not, and uh, so in principle, if uh, you were able to even, so the idea is that all of these add up into some error sometimes. That it, and it, it might be systematically predictable in terms of you can ex find the root cause of it, but if you can't find the root cause of it, it contributes to this unpredictable error. And if it's a true random error, what that would look like on terms of some comparison to a real value, if you, could, if you knew the real values, so this would be a real uh, value, and then you take the measurement measured. Um, if it was a true, truly random error, what you would see is a scatter on both sides, both under predicting and under under predicting. That uh, depending on the precision of your measurement, you might get a tight scatter or you might get a a loose scatter. Uh, but if it goes on both sides, then that means it's not systematic. It's not in the same direction. That's a, it has to be in the same direction, in a similar amount, meaning same direction as well. This is random because it, it's unpredictable. It can go higher or lower, and you can get different v amounts of scatter in terms of how big this cloud is. That depends on the precision of your measurement. Okay, so we'll talk more about those. And um, so here's an example of taking measurements. So erase all this first. So precision um, is tells you how close how close your measurements are to each other. Another way to to uh, describe that or quantify that is. If you have a certain tool, how fine is the scale? To what decimal place can you get an answer? So if you had a ruler, a ruler can give you like a millimeter of a, of a, a marker on the scale, but a caliper will give you microns of a scale. So the caliper is more precise than a ruler, and you can one way to describe precision is the, uh, the minimum scale on the, on the reading, the minimum um, decimal place on the scale. That's another way to describe precision. And we'll talk about that as well. And it doesn't have to be accurate. It's good to be precise, but you have to be also be careful that if you're, if you're not careful and if you're not, something as weird is happening, you can have a very precise tool. You can get a very fine micron length scale, but if something is wrong, something is weird, you might get a bunch of measurements all with fine micron precision, but they can still be wrong. They can, they can still be inaccurate. So it's not the same thing. Pre precision and accuracy are not the same. So, what we're going to do is discuss an example of trying to find the identity of my, my crown, my gold crown. So this is a gold crown, 
or allegedly gold crown. And we're not going to use Archimedes' method to displace water uh, to find the density of this. We don't know. In my story, I'm going to tell you, we're going to use two different tools to find the density of this crown, which is probably water, actually, Archimedes. So what Archimedes did back in the olden days, he uh, used the principle of displacement to find how, if you dunk it in water, how much water gets displaced by this crown. And then you, uh, you can get the density from there. So we're, we're going to skip that technique, but we're going to say that we're going to use the measurement of mass density to identify a material identity. Material identity. So, is this real gold? Is this real gold or fool's gold? So real gold, the density of real gold, uh, 14 carat or so, is 15.5 grams per centimeter cubed. So this is our expected value. This is our accepted value. If this crown was real gold, the density of this crown should be 15.5 grams per centimeter cubed. If it's fake gold, fool's gold, are suspected, the king looked at this and he says, this might be fool's gold. And if it's fool's gold, we know that the density is 13.8 grams per centimeter cubed. So these are our two expected values. And if we can measure the mass density, we can get some indication of what this crown actually is. And um, we're not going to talk about how this density was measured, but we're going to, uh, this example, we know that if we use two different tools, we'll get two different answers. Um, and if we're honest with our interpretation of the tools, it still can be useful, whether what, it doesn't matter what the value we get, as long as we report our experimental uncertainty, it's going to be very helpful. So, so if this scale, 14, uh, that's 16, 15, 14, 13, 12. Um, so let's say that this is 16 uh, grams per centimeter cubed. So this is our results of our mass density meter, which um, doesn't exist, but we'll put our results here. What we're expecting, our expected values, the target on this uh, bullseye is either 15.5, that would be gold. If it's less dense, 13.8-ish, This would be fools. We'll be playing ourselves here. Fool's gold. Okay? So, the first tool we use, it's not precise. The uh, ruler on there, the scale, the reading scale is very um, broad. It doesn't give us a precise number. But we can give an honest answer if we also give what the measurement reading is and the uncertainty of that reading. So the first one gives a reading of 
let's say that it's somewhere next to uh, it's like 14.8 let's say so let's say 14.8 but if we're going to report a value of our uncertainty we're going to say that this is 14.8 but to be honest from with you based on the limitations of the scale on my uncertainty is pretty big. It can be 14.8 plus or minus one gram per centimeter cube, or even more than that. So it's a pretty big uncertainty because we're being honest. We're saying that this scale is not that good. Um, so the number I'm getting is 14.8, but um, I have to be honest with our range of, this is my best guess within this range. So this is our first tool, tool number one. Tool number two is a little bit better in terms of it gives us a bigger certainty on the, uh, the value we're getting. So if we report this number, we can report this as somewhere here in the 13, like somewhere in the low uh, 14s. So the second value would be 14.1 that we get from the better tool and it has a smaller uncertainty. So this is tool two. So tool two says it's 14.1 grams per centimeter cubed and I'm, that the scale and the clar clarity of this number is so uh, better than the other one, I can say it's within like plus or minus 0.5. So, how can we, so what does this mean? It means that uh, both, both, um, we are honest for both, um, both, both tools, both tool results. So both results, why? Because we gave our error. We reported the error, the experimental uncertainty. We said evaluating the limitations of this tool, the number I get is 14.8, but it has a, uh, this range of uncertainty. The better tool gives us a smaller uncertainty. So these are both valid answers because we gave uh, an assessment of the error. Of course though, but tool two uh, gives a more precise answer. Um, precise here, we're we're, it's another way to describe precise. It's not because we took a lot of measurements and they gave a similar result. That's, that is precise, but another way of the uh, property of precision is that your range of uncertainty is smaller. So tool two gives a more precise answer. And the thing, the interesting thing about tool number one is it doesn't give you a conclusive answer. If we're honest with this measurement, which we are, the, the identity of this crown could either be gold or fool's gold because um, the limitation of our tool overlaps, uh, the, the, the range that possible values that this tool can give you overlaps both the real gold and the fuel's gold. So tool one gives in conclusive So tool two provides conclusion that um, the crown is fake. It's fool's gold, not real gold. Fool's gold is another way of, I mean, it's a common uh, material that looks like gold, but it's not really gold. 
fool's gold. And thanks to having a tool two, we're able to answer that question. If we only answer, had tool one and we're honest with ourselves, we could uh, have it, we wouldn't be able to tell. Or if we use tool one and we were not honest with ourselves, we would think it's real gold, which is bad. We played ourselves if we did that. Okay. So yeah, that's a, a, a valid exercise to say that I don't have a precise tool, and if we're honest, we'll be able to not fall into the trap of thinking it's real gold. It, it, it's inconclusive, but because we assessed our uncertainty, we did not fall into the trap and make a conclusion that's not valid. We had a better tool, thankfully, and with uh, more precision, we were able to get a conclusion that no, this is not a real goal. So that's an example. Okay. Another issue is actually reading the scale. This was a scale here, but uh, we kind of skipped some details on that. And um, in the olden days, before we had a lot of digital displays and a lot of nice circuits and sensors, we had to use our eyeballs to take a reading off of a ruler, either a ruler for length or a ruler for uh, some needle pointing towards a value in a pressure gauge or a voltmeter and such which uh, we still have today, the, the good pressure gauges and good voltmeters still are not digital. So the question is, even for digital display, how do you interpret that number that's popping out? Which is, a bit, still includes a judgment call in some cases. Okay, so communicating and quantifying experimental uncertainties from reading a scale. So if you had a, med a length ruler, you would have some straight edge. And let's say you're going from zero to one, two, three, four, five, and you had quarter centimeter increment. So this is zero, one, two, three, four, five. Let's say this is centimeters. And you wanted to measure, measure the length of a rod so what you would do is you would put the you would line up the rod with the straight edge, which is a, you know it's hard to get perfect. Of course. So let's say that this edge was like this, and this is how what you did. You hopefully lined up the center here with the center here to get a measurement. That's a whole uncertainty in itself. How do you line it up right? Is this edge squared up? Is this edge squared up? It's hard to get perfect. That's, what, uh, as long, that's fine as long as you, you have some analysis and uh, logic to how you interpret your measurement at the end. So uh, you have some length here that you're measuring with the ruler. 
So according to how I draw, drew this, um, this actual length of the ruler is somewhere in between uh, the increment of 3.25 and 3.5 centimeters. And if you want to be uh, more precise, you can eye, use your eyeballs to judge that it's a little bit closer to 3.25 than 3.5, which is a judgment call. It's an eyeball interpretation, which is uh, the best you can do sometimes. If you had a more, more increments that you can trust, that helps the situation. But at, it's, at some point, you have to make a judgment call on how to read this scale. So uh, what you're doing is you're saying, OK, by judgment, by my eyeball interpretation, L is between um, L is between, I'll say it in English instead of some math, which I'm just trying to say with the thought process, okay? It's somewhere in between 3.25, 3.25 and 3.5 centimeter, okay? And if you want to be more greedy, you can say it's closer to 3.25 though. And if you want to, uh, uh, so it's, it's perfectly valid, it's reasonable to say that L equals, here what do we see, uh, three, between 3.25 and 3.5, and if you want to divide that by 2, that's 3.3, uh, no, like, 3.37-ish, you know, it's like, I'm going to say 3.37, which is an also eyeballing it because we're adding all these decimal places. I'll just say, you know, 3. Point, whatever is in between 3.35, I'll say like 3.4. because it's in the middle here, which is 3.375, but we don't have all these decimal places here. So you just, you know, uh, use your, your judgment to say it's 3.4-ish, and, but you have to give some uncertainty. What is your uncertainty? Plus or minus the ha the, this increment here, which is um, 0.25. And you can even go smaller than that. You can say plus or minus 0.25. You have, your, you have some insight into the, it, that this is uh, 0.25 centimeters. But what we're doing is we're saying that we can even use our eyeballs to divide that in two, which is 0 0.125. But how are we going to report all of these decimal places here? So you would just say like, you know, plus or minus 0 0.125, which is 0 0.13. But if we look in our book or look at convention, um, this extra three here doesn't really have any meaning because we're not trying to add precision here. We would say this, this is actually something like that. This is all judgment, and if we have logic, it makes sense. So it's reasonable to say this. Why is it reasonable? Because we know that it's somewhere in between these two increments of 3.25 and 3.5, and uh, it's somewhere in the middle. It's not it's not close to, it's, it's somewhere in the middle, but it's unreasonable to say L equals 3.375 plus or minus 0 0.125. 
Why? Because this thing doesn't display uh, decimal places. It shows markers on a ruler. And our eyeballs tell us it's somewhere in the middle, which is 3.375. But um, there's no real justification to say that. But as if, if we look here, it's basically the same thing. It's just rounded up. It's just rounded off more reasonably. So that's what I mean by reasonable. You, you're being honest. You're saying that uh, we know that it's somewhere in between there, but we can't put the decimal places on there. That's, it's, it's, it, we're using our judgment, in our, and it, it, by the judgment, the, the numbers are basically the same, but we're being, by using this proper amount of decimal places, we're acknowledging that our scale is not giving us these, all these decimal places. So that's what I mean by kind of, you know, thinking about it. This takes a lot of thinking and logic, which is um, good. Okay. So that's good. And similarly here, um, with the vote, with the less, with less scale marks. See if I can do this. Uh, get a nice scale going here. So if this is Okay, that's good. One, two, three, four, five. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. So this is an old old school voltmeter. Old school voltmeter. And let's say that this needle, this is your indicator needle. It goes uh, up and down depending on the what it senses. So this is a case where you have to apply the same logic where your, your, your uh, indicator scale, it's not that fine, but we can clearly see that this is closer to five than it is to six. So in this case, um, that in this case, our best estimate so this would be an example of our best estimate. It's a measurement. It's not perfect. It's best because we're acknowledging the limitations of our tool. Here we can say the best estimate of our volt reading is that the voltage equals 5.2 plus or minus 0 0.1 volts. So here, we're not using uh, the, the, the precision of the scale is very broad. It's either five or six, but we're using our eyeballs. We're saying this clearly is not in the middle. It's somewhere closer to five. And if we drew our imaginary eyeballs, it doesn't go, it doesn't approach. Uh, we're kind of making our own scale with our eyeballs here, which is fine as long as you uh, describe it. So the point here is, is that judgment in eyeballs are fine but um, error, anal uh, uh, error analysis and judgments and logic must be discussed. And in our class of our, in the case of our lab reports, this is what I'm expecting, this type of thought process to how to interpret the readings we're taking. Um, so that's one thing, and um, so yeah, this is there's, these are both similar processes, but the difference is that they have we have this one we're kind of relying more on the fact that we have a fine scale. This one we have less of a fine scale. 
And, uh, but either case, you can do, you can uh, take, use your judgment to decide how fine you want to take it. But this doesn't make sense here because it's two, the decimal places. If you don't have the readings of these decimal places, you can't really justify applying all these decimal places. This gives you 0 0.25, but not 0 0.375, which is the middle of uh, between these two. Okay. So, so you can repeat measurements. So a different topic about random error. So for random error, So repeat measurements help to uh, refine, not necessarily reduce, but to refine and quantify the uncertainty with more certainty. So it gives you more certainty in terms of quantifying the limitation of your measurement if you take more measurements, the more measurements you take. But you have to be careful is that random error only applies if conditions are repeated. which is hard to do, but what you would say is like, you need a fresh sample every time, or by taking this measurement here, it doesn't affect the next measurement. So uh, what that means is, you know, uh, next measurement is independent of the previous, for example. Or, uh, you know, your uh, conditions change each time you do a measurement. So you have to be careful that when you, uh, if, or whether you're truly repeating the same conditions, whether the sample changes or whether the conditions change, whether your tool changes, whether the temperatures change and cause a problem. You can imagine all these things that can play into. So you always have to be careful. And a uh, systematic error, again, reminding you that systematic error may exist, but some knowledge of expected value is needed to find it. So just some general tips. Okay, so that's all I had today. Uh, we'll talk more about more about the uh, how to uh, treat these measurements, especially when we use these measurements in an equation to interpret that. So if you want to measure the speed of an object moving in space, you can measure the distance it travels and you can time how long it takes to do that. So the question is, how does your uh, error in the length measurement and error in the time measurement affect your velocity measurement? That's what we're going to talk about next. Thank you. See you guys next time.